the idea that we came up with together was to look at how humanitarian aid and climate change adaptation are linked. Um, what is the potential and what are the limitations for humanitarian aid to contribute to climate change adaptation or longer term vulnerability reduction? Mm. The climate change and the humanitarian spheres um, have been relatively separated even though they are very closely linked. So the climate change adaptation community has been looking at the longer term adjustments to climate change and how you reduce vulnerability in the long term. Whereas the humanitarian aid has also been looking at vulnerability and people have been working very practically with the most vulnerable groups. Originally mostly in the short term, but actually it's been evolving to look also at slightly longer term issues. So both communities actually look at vulnerability and there's been an increasing awareness that it's through the way that we manage some of the extreme events that we're also adapting to climate change. Because one of the manifestations of climate change is that there could be more and more frequent and more extreme climatic events. We decided to look at several case studies. Initially six, we ended up with seven case studies. Uh, seven different countries look at different humanitarian aid approaches. Everything from food aid to so social protection, um, preparedness, forecast-based financing in different geographic and political contexts. So we had uh, case studies in Nepal, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, in Ethiopia, Kenya, Zambia, and Malawi. We have been working in Bangladesh mm. about how people's lives and livelihoods are affected by cyclones mm. and how livelihoods can be protected. And when they cannot be protected, people can find alternative livelihoods so that their lives can move on even after a disaster. So we took this as a case study and we found that uh, the cyclone intensity is increasing as sea level, uh, as, as the sea temperature is increasing too. Mm. So an intense cyclone means it brings in more water and hurl it to a large area uh, on the coast mm. and through the tidal network of rivers. So it goes like upstream something like 20 miles or so the the rivers get affected by the storm surge so that means you have like 10 feet um, high waves soon after a cyclone which kind of inundates large part of the villages and islands on the the river network so it's a very low-lying country Bangladesh mm. so that kind of wipes out houses farms cattle so what happens is after a cyclone, people find it very hard to kind of regain their livelihood probably up to two years or even more. So it requires humanitarian assistance all through. Currently, the disaster risk reduction measures are aimed at saving lives. And they're doing a fantastic job about that. So they are aimed at uh, disasters themselves. Once it hits, then yeah, we save the situation. Yes, yes. So what we're looking at is from this disaster risk reduction one, which saves lives very well, to disaster risk reduction two, which saves livelihoods also. So that means the humanitarian assistance need to look at better forecasts and better planning to what to do about people's farms, uh, farm producers and cattle and poultry if there is a cyclone. Can we save some of it by placing some of these assets on higher grounds or making a way to sell off some of these assets when there's a warning about a cyclone that is two or three days ahead or when there is nothing can't be done in some of the villages which are so low lying and you have to kind of endure it you can evacuate people so maybe the option is to encourage people to take up alternative livelihoods. Since Malawi already has had so many uh, serious famines triggered by droughts, I wanted to see what, what has their response been. Because preparedness, which is I'm very 
interested in is to find us to to anticipate or, or foresee I mean that's kind of the forecast and then it's also defined as respond to and recover from so we have these three key words here foresee uh, respond to and recover from and Malawi has done something that I find very interested, interesting. They have chosen to go for a social protection program that both is a way to uh, recover from famines and also a way to prevent, prevent uh, famines to happen in the future. It's a preparedness um, activity. And the kind of social protection they have done is to uh, do input subsidies. They have subsidized fertilizer and seed because you know 85% of their people live yeah, on almost. agriculture so yeah. that makes sense. So that's kind of the social security program. Mm -hmm. And this has been very contested. Uh, the Malawian government wanted to do this and donors who play a very important <coughs> role in Malawi was not so happy about this. Mm. So for 10 years, this uh, input subsidy program mm. that I call social protection was able to keep hunger and famine more or less uh, away from Malawi. Mm. Malawi had 10 years where they were more or less able to, to feed themselves. They even exported maize to, to Zimbabwe and, and to Kenya, um, which was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> Malawi exporting maize to Zimbabwe. Yeah. That was that. That's so just ridiculous. Yeah. 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 Um, but then in in 2015 came a very serious flooding, and in 2016 came El Nino with a very serious droughts. So, the although the input subsidy program was able to contribute towards building resilience and the country doing much better for those 10 <laughs> years. But then with two new crises like that, it was too much. So now again, unfortunately, the country is in huge problems and there are a lot of people now are in a hunger situation. Uh, it's based in the island, uh, South Pacific island nation of Vanuatu. Um, country of a quarter of a million people spread over 80 islands. Uh, it's ranked number one for high risk in the World Disaster Risk Index. Uh, it uh, experiences a couple of cyclones a year on average, and uh, as well as volcanoes, earthquakes, droughts, flooding. So it's, it's uh, it, for a lot of people, it's a very hazardous location. The population um, makes its livelihood almost entirely from subsistence agriculture or sub semi-subsistence agriculture. A lot of people are on the edge of the cash economy. It's not, there's not, people, many people don't have money at all. Um, and uh, so a lot of the population lives in isolated villages in, in remote locations. So uh, we looked at Cyclone Pam, which was one of the strongest cyclones ever in the South Pacific last year, came last year. Uh, category 5 went right over the populated areas of the islands of destroying 80% um, or more of the housing and many other buildings. Uh, <clears throat> the majority of the food crops were destroyed or damaged and um, fortunately very few people died. So uh, as a result of this there was a massive humanitarian aid effort and the local uh, government, national government was overwhelmed by this. And there was a couple of differences. The government didn't want to provide immediate food aid because of uh, dependency issues that we just talked about, that we talked about before. And uh, the NGOs wanted to provide it. So there are all kinds of issues with this, as you can see. So in the because of the history of uh, um, supposed dependence on food aid after disasters in Vanuatu, we uh, argue, there's an argument that there's nothing wrong with this for an extreme event. So, so we looked at a couple of questions about dependency and about whether the aid uh, had a big impact and transformed communities <coughs> or, or villages or whatever. Um, in summary, we would uh, say that there wasn't much evidence the aid 
alone had had a major impact. Um, <clears throat> and there's very limited evidence for dependency. Mm. But, but there has been major impact from, as I mentioned, uh, the introduction of mobile technology. Mm. And this has had a number of perhaps unexpected um, uh, side, side effects. One is in traditional villages where tradition, in the past, until 2010 or so, they had to walk to get a message a long way, maybe a day. Mm. Uh, now they send text message. But because people generally want to send text messages rather than walking, uh, and if you can't read, you can't send a text message. Mm. So this has led to children attending the school where they never attended school in this area. So there are major changes happening. In each case study, we followed a particular approach to see to what extent was that approach um, contributing or, or potentially contributing to longer term vulnerability reduction, to what extent was it able to focus on um, giving more voice to vulnerable groups in adaptation decision making or de development decision making. Um, so it was a mixture of local level interviews, local level discussions, and also review of the policy context and how different organizations, different humanitarian and government and development organizations work together. Uh, we are working on uh, the impact and the role of humanitarian aids in Afar area in Ethiopia. And uh, Afar areas are located in a very dry, persistent drought area, and uh, they are agro-pastoralists, most of them are pastoralists, there is uh, huge tribal conditions, and uh, we try to, to investigate the current problems they have, especially putting the gender issue, and we try to see the gender issue and what power relationships they have, and also what problems do they exist, and how do we solve these problems? These were the uh, first point that we did, and uh, we did our study in the northern part and eastern part of Afar, and uh, we had significant number of farmers associated with our interviewing and focus group discussions. And what we found was uh, the Afar women are being overloaded because the men migrate to search for other jobs, and the woman has to do everything, even for the main to-do list activities, like fetching water. So the workload of the household has been already loaded for children and women. Women cannot work, they have to look after the children, the weak animals, and also the elders. So there are a lot of workload comparing to the highland-based women. This is a major problem. The second problem is because of shortage of food, Women cannot eat the good food, they have to share it to their children and also to the husband. The major problem in relation to the food aid is the distribution arm and distribution centers are located in a very few areas. For example, in 2010, there were only eight distribution areas. Government has started to improve the raising it to 128. However, still we have a problem. What is the problem is women cannot travel up to 200 kilometers leaving the children and the elders at home. So they have to miss the opportunity of getting their food aid. There is a case that has been already reported from the area. Some, some people and some men can go to the nearby, another wife in the city or in a district town. So the original wife cannot even get the small food aid given by the government. Actually, what's interesting in Pakistan is that we found that um, uh, organizations are, uh, the over the last, say, five years or so, there's been a lot of activity between the humanitarian and development organizations and the government to try to set up systems which respond better and also are trying to look at the longer term. Um, and there are there's a there is a move actually to integrate humanitarian and development assistance and try to look for longer term solutions and our findings show though that there's very little activity there's a lot of activity at the national level in this but very little activity at the district levels for example where the local the say the lowest level or tier of government mm. uh, basically is and the ones that are 
actually responding and should know the communities really well mm -hmm. in order to be able to understand uh, who was vulnerable and who was not. Mm -hmm. So capacity and, uh, and competence at that level, both uh, by the, of the government and of the local organizations where each one does like a small piece of the picture, mm -hmm. uh, that, that is quite limited. So there's a big scope for improvement at the, re at the district level with, if between, with coordination between these organizations and the government in uh, trying to kind of, um, uh, kind of cover different pieces of the puzzle locally in the district level and to, get to, and get to know the communities better. And the only way that actually that will happen is if they are much more engaged with communities and communities have a better voice mm. in, in kind of uh, telling about their issues and how they experience uh, both short and long term uh, uh, challenges, uh, whether they're climate change or whether they're of longer term poverty issues. Uh, we had some very interesting meetings uh, where we shared our results in uh, two government and humanitarian organizations uh, very recently at the, fall, at the end of this project. And uh, the way forward I see is that uh, the, the National D Disaster <laughs> Management Authority in Pakistan, um, they are very heavily engaged in competence, competence building at the provincial and are just starting at the district levels. Now, they are in a position to uh, adjust their, uh, say, mapping exercises and training exercises to include social vulnerability. Right now, it's basically about, uh, about hazard vulnerability and looking how to avoid these hazards. But uh, after discussions with the development humanitarian communities uh, with this project, they became very interested in, in uh, including social vulnerability in their assessments and in their trainings. So what we found, which is common across Kenya and Ethiopia, is that there is um, a lot of work, first of all, within the humanitarian sector, a lot of um, discussions around resilience, and in many ways have progressed very far in uh, integrating resilience, integrating longer-term perspectives in their work. But they still find it challenging, and three things I could mention as examples of those challenges are, first of all, institutional fragmentations. Uh, there's a lot of challenges in bringing people together, getting spaces for discussions uh, amidst a, a large number of actors and institutions doing overlapping things and the government coordination in some cases. Um, uh, well, it, it could be, there's still challenges in, in coordination and, and integration of these uh, areas. Uh, another one is um, it, the project, what we call projectization of um, resilience or adaptation, if you will, in that they are often um, sort of targeted projects that are addressing only a, a part of the problem. And often we're looking at the symptoms of uh, vulnerability rather than the causes of it. So we're looking at the immediate impact and obviously as humani humanitarian actors would do that. That's their core business is to respond to, um, to, um, to, to, to disasters and uh, help recovery. But it's also the challenge of moving from response to preparedness. And then often it's still very fragmented and, and doesn't necessarily um, take into account as much as it should this the learning aspect. How can we better learn from what we know already about what w works and what doesn't work? What helps people reduce vulnerability? What what can increase resilience? That learning isn't always integrated, and part of that is related to a third area of, of um, a third challenging area is is to do with financing either that the finance is, is, is quite, uh, that they're uh, lacking flexibility in how financing um, is set up, that, fin that it's easier to get finance, easier to finance recovery than preparedness. What was important as well was we chose some contexts that are conflict, post-conflict, like Pakistan, because that's an important context to the way that humanitarian crisis uh, develop and are, are handled. Humanitarian crises seldom take place in very stable contexts. And we chose some contexts where there's uh, been political transition, like Nepal. Um, 
in Kenya there's been um, devolution going on. So we had a number of different sort of political and social contexts that we wanted to see um, in practice. Yes, yeah, so I did my field work in the region northwest Nepal. Uh, the district is named uh, Humla, and I stayed there for three years. Uh, the topic was on policy processes, humanitarian, humanitarian interventions, and power relations, with a focus on food security and uh, climate change adaptation. Mm -hmm. So the place is actually known for being extremely poor. Uh, so I was a bit unsure what I would uh, meet in my arrival. It's about one week walk from the first uh, road. So I took a, a small plane there. Um, and what I saw is a place with extreme diversity, beautiful place. Uh, many different uh, people coming from a uh, caste system, Hindu people speaking, uh, Buddhist Tibetan speaking people. Um, it's extreme diverse actually, uh, with their own challenges and also uh, many uh, ideas about what they wanted to do in the future. What I saw was I was studying one of the human organizations impact at the local level and I saw that uh, the human organizations did have different impacts on different people. Uh, typically the better off would actually benefit more than, uh, than uh, poor people. Uh, that made the, the gap between poor people and better people even deeper after humanitarian organizations uh, were in. Although their, their wish was actually to, uh, to, uh, to, to help the poorest, mm -hmm. so, so it was a hard, uh, hard way to do it. I also saw that the, um, they made these community-based uh, community user groups, they call it, where every people in the village would actually come to participate. It was a way actually to, to uh, make social inclusion, to, to include all the most vulnerable. But these places were very often dominated by men from uh, the high caste. So although the, the, the policy space that actually put in place were there, uh, and people from low cost, poor people were actually allowed to come, they would not um, feel that influence the decision making processes. So, uh, so it was a it was a challenge that the uh, human organizations have in this place is how to reach the poorest. One thing that came across very clearly is that the relationship between climate change and humanitarian crisis is very complex and nuanced. Intuitively, we think of the fact that climate change may lead to more extremes and more frequent extremes uh, that could lead to more humanitarian crises. Um, but in addition to that, um, there's also the way that humanitarian aid is impacting on the local context. So say if you have an earthquake, the way that that earthquake is handled is going to determine how well people can handle the next climatic event, for example. So even a non-climatic event and how that's handled by humanitarian aid is important for uh, longer term vulnerability. In this case, uh, we're talking about uh, small-scale farmers in north uh, western part of Kenya, uh, which these farmers rely on uh, a variety of crops, but uh, this particular humanitarian project uh, tried to help them by providing them with a, an improved cassava variety <coughs> that tolerates better drought and matures faster and also produces more and is more tolerant of diseases. So the idea was that this cassava crop would help them even in periods of drought or floods and so on. Um, my findings are a bit mixed about the effects of, of this uh, intervention. There are several elements that uh, mm, came out in my research uh, that show actually that uh, such interventions need a, a very careful consideration of the social background or where these interventions take place. For instance, um, issues about land tenure were very predominant in, in the area. Uh, who owns the land and who, who is allowed to use it in which way and so on. 
there was a lot of absentee ownership, people who live in uh, provincial centers but still own, own land, land lo uh, locally. Yeah. And this land is maybe not used or is left fallow for a few years on purpose or by default. Um, the, um, the average uh, ownership of land here is about one acre. Um, this particular crop, cassava, needs quite a lot of place to develop and produce uh, properly. So that was one, one challenge, who is actually able to rely on cassava to for food security and so on. Um, even though it does produce more, uh, it can produce quite a lot, but still you need quite a bit of land to be self-sufficient. Su self yeah. yeah. Another issue was, uh, of course, uh, differences in, in gender uh, regarding access to land and resources. Uh, it was usually the women who make decisions about what to plant and where to plant and so on, but they still do not own the land. Most of the land is is we'll owned by men. Somewhere. Yeah. Mm. yeah, this is also a, uh, a society where you have more wives. Polygamy. So, polygamy. Mm. Uh, and the senior wife has more to say about what is to be done in agriculture than the others. Mm. Uh, we've been looking at the possibility of uh, taking action before disaster that actually happens. So we've been looking at the window of time uh, when you have some level of certainty that a disaster could happen based on, for instance, a forecast of, of rains or droughts and trying to understand how we can make uh, significant contributions and take significant action before the shock actually happens based on uh, science, scientific observations, but also based on a set of agreed principles for action and based on uh, existing adequate funding to take those actions. Um, so this has been tested in several countries, in about 15 countries uh, in, um, in Africa, in Asia, uh, in Latin America, and there has been really um, interesting results. In the case of Bangladesh, which is one of the, in the most recent ones, we are looking at predicting uh, floods and cyclones and trying to take actions before, uh, they, um, before they impact people. And uh, the um, main instrument through which we are uh, supporting people before the shock is by providing cash transfers. Um, the idea is that by having the flexibility of using a cash transfer, people can decide what are the best actions that they can take before the shock happens. So, for instance, someone who has um, animals could decide to evacuate their animals. Somebody who uh, perhaps the need to um, access a loan after they've been affected by a disaster, they, instead of accessing that loan at, uh, afterwards, they can have these funds in advance, exactly. I think that as much as we have to deal with emergencies in the present, mm -hmm. when people's lives are saved, when people are able to move from an emergency into, uh, well, beyond an emergency, they are thinking about what will come next. And one of the things that I was talking about here, and one of the things that I deal with, is thinking about how even in the context of an emergency, the way that people respond, the way that people behave, is often governed by the same ideas as they have under normal circumstances. That in fact these things are very, very similar and so by understanding what people are doing and how they make decisions every day, mm -hmm. we can understand a lot about what they're going to do in the context of an emergency and thus we can help people in the context of an emergency mm -hmm. to both emerge from that immediate problem but also do so in a way that helps their lives moving forward when they're outside of that.